All right, Jeremiah chapter 39 as we continue on. <clears throat> as I said last week, 38, 39, and 40 are dealing with uh, Nebuchadnezzar coming in and taking uh, Judah and Jerusalem into captivity. So finally, it's at, come to the point where they are now uh, getting ready to go in and pretty much shackle them and bring them into captivity. At least all the wealthy, all the politicians, all those that are owners of land and, and fields and so forth. The poor, they're going to leave there. Uh, they'll leave there and they're, they're there for a reason. Paul talks about the battles that we fight on a daily basis. And, and if you're a believer, if you're a true believer in Christ Jesus, uh, you will have battles on a daily basis. Uh, the enemy... Uh, will come against you. Uh, that's just common. Uh, that comes with our relationship with Jesus Christ. Just as Jesus battled it, whether it was with the religious leaders, whether it was his own uh, disciples and the people that followed him, or whether it was even his own family, uh, he had to deal with things on a regular basis just like we do. In our relationships with the world, where we work at, especially where we work out, people know us there. And they know that we're Christians. They, they know that we're light and salt. Uh, they know we stand for something. And so they're going to test you. They're going to poke you. Uh, <clears throat> they're going to see if you really believe what, what you say you believe. And that's a challenge for a lot of us. A lot of times people just give in. A lot of times I go in stealth. Okay, I'm not going to let anyone know I'm a Christian because it's too hard, you know, and so I'm just going to go in there and just kind of hide and do my job. And that's not the way we should live. Uh, we, we should be able to have the power that God has given to us, and it's available to us if we're willing to apply it to our lives. And a lot of times it's just the obedience to the Word of God, applying it to our lives, and watching God then take it from there. But he talks about... <clears throat> the enemy and how we can uh, fight against him in Ephesians 6.10. Let me just read to you uh, what he wrote. I'm not going to get into it in detail because we're going to look at Jeremiah 39, but it, it will remind you of some things and maybe even some teachings that you've heard before in the past on, on, on these different aspects. In 6.10 he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. So that's an admonition. Uh, he's encouraging them. You need to be strong in the Lord. Boy. There's a message right there. Be strong in the Lord. There, there's so much that comes against us, and we need to be strong. There's so many temptations, and we need to be strong. We need to be steadfast. We need to know what we believe and believe it and hang on to it and not ever give it up. We need to be strong. Uh, you think of a, a, a guy like Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you, and you look at the guy, well, maybe not today, but at his prime, and you go, that guy's strong, you know? I mean, he had some, some guns on him. He had a chest. And, and you say, that guy's a strong guy. And that's not what Paul's talking about, though. He, he's talking about the character. He's, he's talking about uh, our, our motives, the heart. He's talking about our minds that we need to be strong in all of those areas to fight against the enemy. So it's be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the whales of the devil. So there's an armor that God has given to us. It's available to us. It's here in the word of God. And every day we should be putting that armor on. If you think about a person that's going in the battle, at least preparing to be in battle, at any moment, every morning he, he wakes up and he begins to put his armor on. You know, he, he starts with his shoes maybe or his breastplate or his helmet and, you know, whatever gloves or, or, or protection he puts on his sleeves. He gets a sword, he gets a stash, and he, he puts it in there and he's getting ready. He's preparing. We should do the same thing. We should be preparing every morning uh, with the armor of God uh, to battle the, the um, devil himself, in a sense, in the Lord's name. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Uh, so he, he divides our battle here. It, it's not a worldly battle. We don't fight a physical battle. Uh, though we're always fighting a physical battle, aren't we? But it is a spiritual battle. It's a battle that we fight on our knees. It's a battle in prayer. It's a battle of patience and perseverance. It's not a battle of pulling the sword out and sticking someone with it or taking your Bible and banging them over the head and say, why don't you wake up? It doesn't work that way. It works the other way when you pray and you seek the Lord and you just wait on Him to do the work in that individual's life. 
or, or, or if the enemy is attacking you, you, you don't, uh, if he's using someone, you don't fight that person. You fight them in the spiritual realm. You ask the Lord to bring angels. You ask the Lord to do work in his heart, change his mind. You know, whatever it is, uh, there's times where I even ask the Lord, Lord, uh, humble them somehow, Lord, so that they fall to their knees before you, uh, whatever way that you would like to. I don't always get specific because I don't want to limit God. God can do anything, and I've seen him. I've seen him soften the hard, hardest hearts you've ever seen in men. You think of the Apostle Paul and how he was out murdering Christians. And God just spoke to him. He, he fell down. He was blind and it changed his life. And so God is able to do anything. Blind him, Lord. Bring an illness. Who knows? Whatever you need to do, Lord, you do it because you know how to do it very well. And so it is a spiritual battle and not a physical battle. Stop fighting the physical battle. You're not getting anywhere. Just just leave them alone. Just let God have them. And God is more than capable of taking care of them. Don't get involved. Well, wait a minute, but I don't get involved. I, I get forced to, to be in this situation. I understand that. Just go through the situation humbly, praying, seeking the Lord, and let God handle it. Oftentimes, that's the best way. Put on that armor of God. He says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand so we need to put on the armor of god uh, jerusalem is going to fall to babylon and so my theme is the fall zedekiah is going to be taken captive and they are heading to babylon to be ruled over by nebuchadnezzar and his officials in a land that they are not familiar with a land that they will be assimilated by a land that they will at one point many of them will will become so comfortable they'll stay there when god finally says it's time to return to to jerusalem after 70 years but it's a whole new life it's a whole new way if you can put yourself there get the picture you know they're taking you they've already killed a lot of your family uh, you're in shackles you're being dragged there and you have no choice to go there so it says in verse 1 in the ninth year of zedekiah king of judah in the tenth month nebuchadnezzar king of babylon all his army came against jerusalem and besieged it now there's probably about five eighty seven bc before christ and, and you remember <clears throat> Babylon has sieged Jerusalem there. In other words, they surrounded them and they cut off all resources to them. And, and so they were, in a sense, starving, uh, starving them out so that they would finally give up and just open the gates and say, come, you know, let's take us. We're done. We're, we're done fighting. We're, we're done holding ourselves in this position. Uh, we're, we're yours. Uh, do whatever it is that you want with us. Uh, it's interesting how that besiege has has grown throughout the years, not just during the time of Babylon, but even during the Roman Empire with Megiddo and how the Roman Empire surrounded uh, Megiddo there as the Jews were stationed up there. And even in um, Monaco, back in the 60s, you remember the story with uh, the actress Grace Grace Kelly and how she married the prince there. And it was uh, Monaco who had a tax-free uh, uh, system for residents there. You could go and live there tax-free. And the French who owned it uh, wanted to get taxes from them. And so they pretty much were trying to force them into paying taxes because the French needed some resources. And so they're going to force Monaco to do so. Well, Monaco's on this beautiful uh, Riviera. You know, I mean, it's just a beautiful place. And, and the king wanted to fight against it. He tried to, as best he could politically. And um, France just besieged them. They, they cut off at the ports. They cut off the routes. They cut everything off. And they said, we'll starve you. We'll wait till you give up. And so they didn't let anything come in. No, no ships go in and out. And they were pretty much starving them. And so it was, uh, I just saw a documentary on it. That's why it, it just came up. Just, if you're wondering, wow, you did a lot of research there. It just God just lays these things in my path sometimes. <laughs> well, Grace uh, Kelly decided that she was going to host a, a uh, ball for the Red Cross humanitarian um, accolades you know to to those that help the less fortunate and at the ball 
is when she invited everybody uh, from the United States to France to Britain, I mean, everyone to come on out that was important. And France wasn't going to come out, but uh, they were, in a sense, encouraged to come out by uh, some other means. And so he came out. And as she, she gave a speech, she talked about the, the whole Red Cross and how it, it's done out of love and compassion for others that are less fortunate and so forth. And then during his, her speech, she said, that's what I want. I want love because it's love that changes hearts. It's the love that we're supposed to give uh, to others. It's love for this country, Monaco, that I am now a part of and the people that are here. And I am willing to stay in my castle and allow someone to bomb me. I will die for this place. And there's a French and French uh, Prime Minister sitting right there, like, oh boy. And, and so when she's all done, this guy leans over, so are you going to bomb her house? You know. And so in a sense, she used this political power to force him to go, well, no, I'm not going to bomb Grace Kelly. You know, she's from the United States. She's a great actress. And so they you know, removed the, the siege. But that's what the siege was. And so they, they forced you to do something. That's what Babylon did. And they finally won. Uh, after uh, some time, in fact, verse 2 says, In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, which was about 16 months later when they started the besiege, uh, on the ninth day of the month, the city was penetrated. So it lasted about a year and a half. So you can just imagine a year and a half of, of not being able to leave. There was a time when Egypt, remember last week, Egypt uh, started to harass Babylon, and so they had to go take care of that, and so they opened up the gates. They were able to, to leave sh for a short period, but they had to come back because Babylon came back. And so for a whole year, uh, they were pretty much closed in there in the walls of Jerusalem. Then all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. And I'm not going to try to pronounce all these names. <laughs> So these were all the princesses there of the king of Babylon. Uh, they captured the city and, and they set up a ruling council basically at the gatehouse. And, and these men were the ones that were pretty much dictating who was going to go, who was going to stay. You know, they, they were the captains, they were the officials over the whole situation. Uh, So it was, verse 4, when Zedekiah, the king of Judah, and all the men of war saw them, that they fled and went out of the city by night, uh, by way of the king's garden, by the gate between the two walls, and he went out by way of the plain. So Zedekiah, very familiar uh, with uh, Jerusalem, and knew that there was a way out that he could possibly escape. Now you remember that Zedekiah was actually put there as the last king of Judah by Babylon. But eventually he rebelled against Babylon, and so now Babylon is furious because he rebelled when they first set him up there. And so he was supposed to be their man, but he turned out that he uh, wasn't their man any longer, and he knew that, and so he tried to escape them uh, by going through uh, the plains there. So he fled to Arba, which is the Jordan Valley to north of the Dead Sea. But the Chaldeans, or the Babylonian army, pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And when they had captured him, they brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, to Riblah in the land of Hamath, where he pronounced judgment upon him. So they pursued him, they caught him, and they brought him to Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, they caught him somewhere there in Jericho, which is east of Jerusalem, on uh, the way there to, to Jericho, close by. And Zedekiah didn't get very far uh, when the whole army just pretty much uh, took him. Then the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes at Riblah. The king of Babylon also killed all the nobles of Judah. So uh, you can imagine that seeing your sons uh, being killed before you and then you being taken into to Babylon. Not a good sight. I can imagine all the emotional stress that he was probably under at that point uh, watching his children die so much so that what's going on in, in, in Iraq and some of those uh, little countries there where ISIS coming in and taking all the young ladies and, and 
selling them. I just heard today that sometimes they sell these ladies for a pack of cigarettes to somebody. They're just crazy. And then killing the, the sons and killing the husbands and right there in, in front of the family. It's a horrific thing. Um, Ann Kohler. I just thought this was interesting. I need to do a little more research. Maybe you, you've heard of this already or maybe not. But she was talking about ISA and how you know they're beheading uh, people, uh, especially Christians, that they're out to behead Christians. Um, and it's a big thing. At least for us, it's a big thing. It's in the news, and it's something that the world is looking at. But yet Ann Kohler has done some research, and she's saying that Mexicans have beheaded more people than ISA. And I thought, that's interesting. I never even thought of that. <clears throat> the cartel and the mafia and you know uh, that are here in the United States and you see some of the pictures of what they've done there in Mexico when you they lay them all out in the streets and stuff they've beheaded more than ISA wow so so how big is ISA how big is is the Mexican mafia uh, I tell you that the, if the underlying system there is the devil and he's the one that's in control of all that and, and he just hates life and he hates people and he hates to see Christians um, having a victorious life and so uh, if he can he will destroy you and he has done a good job whether it's through ISA whether it's through the Mexicans and I mean the the mafia and those that are evil people that have really no heart and to do something like that you know you, you have to be evil you have to be evil your conscience has to be seared you know like with a hot iron where you don't feel they gotta be lunatics or homeopathic killers, you know, in some way that they just don't feel. And from what I understand, too, and things that I've read in articles, that a lot of people from the United States who, who like to kill have joined ISA. And, you know, with the disguise and so forth, they're, they're doing, doing what they love doing. So uh, horrific things. Uh, but to see your sons uh, killed before your eyes, I don't know what mom wouldn't, wouldn't cry, you know, wouldn't be under a lot of stress, probably fall over and have a heart attack. Uh, we are so blessed in this nation, aren't we? At least right now, that, that we don't really see a whole lot of that here. And that, that's a problem because then we don't care because it's not affecting me. And we should care. We should care for Nepal that the gospel goes to. Um, right now, Mike McIntosh has stepped down from his church, uh, Horizon, <clears throat> and he's in Iraq right now. And he's trying to help the whole situation over there with ISA and, and the Palestinians and, and so forth. So he sees a higher calling for himself. Uh, we should care about those things. Uh, we should think about uh, voting. We should think about the political situation. We should. These are things that should be on our minds. But we're Americans. What is on our mind? The American dream. You know, the number one dream is a house with a car and a good job. You know, those are things that are on our minds. A nice vacation twice a year and so forth. I understand that. That was my dream. And I got that dream. You know, I, I got the job making $100,000 a year. I got the house. You know, I had the cars. We had the vacations. We've done all that. And looking back at all of that, I mean, it's nice. I still have the house. I don't have the cars, but, you know, I... I got some of that stuff, but it was so unfulfilling. I love this better than that. I love the baptism and watching people you know, commit themselves to the Lord you know, in front of people and say, I'm going to surrender myself to God. I love that stuff. I love what's going on in Nepal and going through the jungle and, and helping and ministering to people or going to Mexico and giving them gifts you know, and sharing the gospel. That I love. I love serving. I love being here and watering and washing windows. I love that. I love that more than anything else. It's just, there's so, it's so satisfying. Some of you might think, okay, you're crazy. You don't, <laughs> you don't, I know you don't know what I'm talking about. The Spirit of God hasn't really taken a hold of your, your heart yet. You haven't allowed Him because there's something in serving that is just such a blessing. Uh, and we think it's serving ourselves that's the blessing. Uh, you're missing it completely. It's not. It's serving others that's the blessing and you get from it. it. It sure does take your mind off your own problems. It really does. Off your own pain and off your own hurt. And you focus on others and their pain and their hurt and what you can do to help them. 
So his sons die before his eyes. And moreover, verse 7, uh, he put out Zedekiah's eyes and bound him with uh, bronze uh, feathers uh, to carry him off to Babylon. And the Chaldeans burned the king's house and the house of the people with fire and, and broke down the walls of Jerusalem. Uh, besides Zedekiah, you know, other nobles and officials were also killed there in Jerusalem and their houses were burnt and things like that. So you can just imagine what, what was going on at, at that time. They were losing everything. Uh, that's why we're not to hang on to things too tightly. I had a, a new car back in the uh, 80s. We bought a um, Grand Prix. It was one of our first brand new cars. Big car. Could put all the boys in the back, all four of them. And then me and Virginia and a friend, we had a radio and air conditioning. And, and it was like, wow, we've made it, you know. And, and it was a good thing. And, and we had uh, been working out at 24-Hour Fitness when it was over here on, in Indian Hills. And we had parked it out there and we came out and it was gone. It was gone. Someone stole it. And we, we I don't even know, remember how we got home. She'll tell me afterwards. But um, we thought it was a friend playing a joke. Of course, we couldn't figure out how he'd get the keys, but he was pretty crafty. Uh, so, so we thought it was him, but it wasn't. Someone literally stole the vehicle. But it's uh, interesting because as me and Virginia were thinking about it, normally we probably would have been freaking out that we had become Christians and our faith was growing. And we just realized, Lord, you gave it to us, and so you can take it away. Yeah, someone else took it, but Lord, it's yours. And so you allowed that to happen in our lives. So we just, you know. We have a peace that you're going to, you know, provide for us. And, and he did. You know, and it was also nice that the head had a leak, so what they got wasn't much. Um. <laughs> so, you know, just hold on to things lightly because, man, you just never know. An injury. And there you are on, dis on disability, and you're going to lose your house or your car. Don't hang on to those things. Because you never know what's going to happen. And Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, verse 9, the captain of the guards, carried away captive to Babylon the remnant of the people who remained in the city and those who defected to him with the rest of the people who remained. So obviously, you know, this, this guy's coming in. He's the captain of the guards. He's, he's kind of organizing this whole thing and he's taking people. But then there's also those people there. You know, don't take me. I'm coming. I'm coming. You know, they defect on his side. They're maybe even giving up other people. I know where they're at. Go over there down the street to make a left and you'll find a group of them in this place. You know, so just all of that going on. But Nebuzar Adan, the captain of the guard, left in the land of Judah the poor people who had nothing, and gave them vineyards and fields at the same time. Now, that's interesting. Why would he do that? He took the, the wealthy, the rich, the politicians, the intelligent, not, not that poor people are dumb, I'm not saying that, but he took these people that are, that are workers and, and, and they know how to make money, they know how to set things up, and they took them all but left the poor. Why is that? Poor are easier to control. And they have nothing. So you give them a phone, like Obama phone, and boy, they become, you know. <laughs> and you become their friend for life. We still do it today. Hillary is, is mastering that right now. This is how they're going to win the election. They are saying... They're not focusing on gaining people. They're focusing on changing the uh, voting uh, rights. And if they can change that, then they can get all the illegal aliens to vote. Well, who are they going to vote for? They're poor people. Who's giving them what they want? Who's giving them the Obama phones? Who's giving them you know, the welfare? Who's giving them the medical? Well, the Democrats is. So let's vote for them because they're giving us what we want. And that's how they get the vote. And that's not right. That's not fair. So these guys know what they're doing. <laughs> they knew what they were doing back then. They're, they're allowing the people to stay there. They're more easily controlled. Hey, we're going to give you some land. Hey, remember the guy you used to work for? Here, take it. It's yours now. Really? Okay. Well, I like you guys. You know, and so now they're on your side. And so easier to control. Uh, they knew what they were doing. Now, Jeremiah goes free. Verse 11. Uh, Jeremiah the prophet that God has been using hasn't seen one convert yet. Um, the Lord has 
definitely blessed him with the word of the Lord, and he's been faithful to preach that word at all cost. He's uh, laying in a cistern at this point, the bottom of this little dome in mud, ready to die with a few pieces of bread probably uh, still there, if not nothing. Uh, and so now he has the opportunity to to finally be saved here. And Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah. Now that's interesting because Nebuchadnezzar knew Jeremiah. He knew that he was a prophet of God. And so there's a connection there. Uh, so he gave this uh, charge to Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him and look after him and do him no harm. But do him do to him just as he says to you. So that's interesting that, that God lays it on the heart of Nebuchadnezzar not to harm Jeremiah. So can God do anything? Of course he can. Later on, interesting, read the book of Daniel and you find out about Nebuchadnezzar. God must have been working in his heart somehow. Even though he was a, an evil, wicked king, uh, wasn't a Jew, uh, Gentile, I guess, um, God was working in his heart. There's a point where, where God turns him basically into an animal and he's eating grass and he has to finally acknowledge the, the true and living God. It reminds me of what uh, people go through today before uh, they finally give up and say, okay, God, I'll, I'll surrender my life to you. I'll surrender my life to you. Believe me, if you are God's, and you are, and if he loves you, and he does, he's after you. And he will allow things to go on in your life to bring you right back where you're supposed to be. I've seen people do circles. You know, they start their journey, and then all of a sudden they veer off, but then they come right back to that circle. Some of them takes a year or two. Some of them 10 years, 15 years, but they're, they're starting back there. Why go through all that? Why go through the pain of, okay, just pain, because I mean, I can come up with a list of different things that I've seen people go through because of bad choices, because of pride, unwillingness to surrender or even to forgive. Why not just allow God to run your life? Just surrender and say, okay, Lord, just lead me and I'll follow. You know, you get that picture of the horse and the guy's sitting in the back of the buggy and he's got this like fishing pole rod and it's got a string hanging and he's got a carrot there and the horse sees the carrot and the horse is like and the guy just takes the carrot moves it where he wants and the horse just keeps going after the carrot right like just be a horse you know and just let god you know lead you let god lead you where he's leading you and just be content in that god led me I really believe from an earlier from an early age. He's always given me a heart for people. I've always had this heart for people. I was always concerned about poor people and so forth. Always tried to be helpful, just like my sons have always tried to be helpful as they grew up. There's just a, a desire to be a helpful person for those that are less fortunate, the underdogs, you know, in a sense. I'm always for the underdogs, even if it was my team. I want the underdogs to win. <laughs> just something about that. And, and God just led me to, to this prosperity. I mean, he blessed me. Uh, I come from a, a family. My mother and father didn't even graduate junior high. My father worked in a factory, Norris Industries. He made the shells for, for the uh, army, the bullets and, and the, you know, the missiles and stuff like that. That's what he did, assembly line. Shh, shh, shh. Every day, every day, every day, that's what he did wasn't an educated person. By the time I was in high school, I was smarter than him. But I loved my dad. And he taught me a lot of good principles. And God led me to, to understand the principle of working hard and the American dream. And I, and I had all that. But it, it, it was nothing compared to what God did have for me, truly had for me. And that was this ministry, to be the pastor of this church. And to lead those people that want to be led. Because you can't lead people who don't want to be led. You can only lead people who want to be led. That's just the way it is. And if you want to be led, then God will lead you. See, all that other stuff is not worth it. Just let God lead you and direct you. God led me. When I 
got into the ministry, didn't even know I was going into the ministry. I just said, leave me, Lord. I'll just clean toilets. I'm happy with that. And I did that for years. And then it was a deacon and an elder. And he just led me from there on and on. Then it was running the whole church while the pastor was sick and taught me what I needed to learn to have my own church. Just kept leading me. Even though I never saw myself as a pastor, didn't desire it. He just led me. I just followed the carrot. <laughs> and this is where I'm at today. Still trying to follow the carrot. See, my plans would be different. If, if I was God, it'd be different. We'd be huge by now. <laughs> you know? We'd have a bigger building you know, right there on a the main street where people drive by and they see you all the time. Not in a dark corner where there's no lights, you know, and residents come in and out like, what kind of church is that? It must be Spanish, you know? <laughs> you know I wouldn't put any of I wouldn't put me there, you know? But no, I gotta follow the carrot, right? I gotta follow the carrot and just I gotta go where God has me. And he has me right here. You know, for this little area. But he's moving us, right? He's moving us to a bigger area. We did the Summerfest, Harupa Valley. City Council knows us now. The Parks and Rec knows us now. You know, I'm hoping next week I'm gonna go to a a, a uh, invitation to the sheriff's department and and uh, chaplains, I got invited to that, and, and I got a meeting before that, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it. So pray for me that I can somehow get there. But now the sheriff's, you know, God's moving us to a bigger thing. So just follow the carrot. Let God do it. Let God do it. So Nebuchadnezzar said, hey, take care of this guy. And so verse 13, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guard, sent uh, uh, Nebuch Hajban, oh boy, these names, forget them, these officers, verse 14, and they sent uh, someone to take Jeremiah from the court of the prison and committed him to uh, Gidliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan, uh, and that he should take him home so he dwelt among the people. So this is how he took care of him, put him under protection, you know, uh, services, and so he was able to survived through all this. Meanwhile, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison saying, go and speak to Ebed, Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring my word upon the city for adversary and not for good. And they shall be uh, performed in that day before you, but I will deliver you in that day, says the Lord. And you shall not be given into the hands of the men whom you are afraid. Now you remember last week we, we talked about him and how he actually helped Jeremiah. So now Jeremiah's kind of assuring him that God's got his back. For I will surely deliver you and I shall, or you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you. There's that, that word. I mean, you're going to, God's going to spare you and he's going to give you a gift. And that's what God has done for us, right? Through Jesus Christ. Our life is a price to us because he saved us from the pit of hell, from outer darkness for eternity. Think about that for a little bit. We, we forget that. You can't forget that, what God has saved us from. If you forget that, then you start living in the world. It's a price. We deserve hell because we're in rebellion against God. Our nature is to be rebellious. But God has given us a gift, His Son, Jesus Christ. And if we just trust Him, like He says in the next, next statement, because you have put your trust in me, says the Lord. So if we just trust Him, then He gives us eternal life. So if you just follow that carrot and just trust God that He's leading you on the right path, God will take care of you. He'll protect you. And some of you might think, well, you know, I, I don't like where the carrot's leading me right now. That's Okay. Just enjoy where you're at right now. Enjoy what you have right now. I remember when I first got hired on to Edison, and some of my high school buddies, we still used to hang around with them. And they had uh, gotten together. Because Virginia and I have been married since 15 by this time. <clears throat> well, we got married at 18, but we've been together since 15. So it's like we've already started our family. We already have a place to live. And here are my old high school friends. They're getting together and trying to live in a place, you know, so you got three, four guys living in one place. So I'd go over there and, um, 
hang around them, drink beer, party, and all of that thing. And I'd be the one buying all the pizza. I'd be the one all supplying all the beer, you know, because these guys are really working, trying to figure out what they're going to do. They're putting a little money just to have a, a place to live, you know, and I'm already working for Southern California Edison, making good money. You know, so be content where you're at. God will provide for you. He'll lead you and guide you. But where you're at is not where you'll be later on. And that's okay. Because God has a plan for your life. Just be open to that plan. So how do we how do we live to close? How do we live in a world that wants to enslave us? Because the world does want to enslave us. I mean, there's not someone out there, you know, following you around. I'm going to enslave you. Uh, but the world wants to enslave you in its stupidity. <laughs> in its system, in the luxuries of life, the lust of the eyes, and pride, and all those things. It wants to enslave you. It wants to be master and ruler over you. It wants to control you. Well, how do I know if it's controlling me when, when you're not stopping, when you can't stop, and you keep doing it? That's when you know that uh, it is master over you. If money is master over you, then that means you're working a lot. You're, you're working on Sundays, you're working on Wednesdays, you're working on event days because you want the money. You want the resources. It's mastered over you. Try, try to stop. Try to stop and, and go to church on a Sunday or try to stop and go to an event. Oh, but yeah, but then I can't pay my bill. You know, see, It's mastering over you. You're living your life for mammon and not for the Lord and you can't live for one or the other. That's what the Bible says. So, so how do we fight against that? Back to Ephesians. Back to Ephesians. We are to put on the armor of God. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel, above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darks of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is a word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication of Spirit, being watchful to the end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mysteries of the gospel, Paul said. Look, we're in a war and the world wants to enslave us. So we've got to put on that armor of God. We need to be in prayer. We need to be perseverance, uh, persevering. We need to be watchful. These are things that we need to do. We need to watch everything. We need to understand what's going on around us, who we're hanging around with. What are our desires? On, on Sundays, we're, we're listening to Jesus, a Sermon on the Mount. And he's getting to the heart of the issues, the heart, the motives of why we do what we do. Why do we do what we do? We have to ask ourselves those things. Why am I working so hard? Why am I trying to get these things? Is it for the glory of God or, or is, is it so that I can you know, boast about it? Virginia and I have been blessed. God has always been with us. Again, the, the thing, principles that my dad taught me about working hard, and I've always worked hard as best I could, and, and we've always been able to survive through bills and tough times because God has always been there, even though we've not been there for God. And we used to have friends, uh, his name was Frank Corpus, <clears throat> good friends that we hung around with quite a lot. And he would always tell me, he'd always tell me, because he'd see what we have, and he'd say, wow, Reuben. You did this all yourself. He'd always tell me that. You did this all yourself. And you're a good guy. You did this all yourself. You know, I'm like, yeah. Because I was very prideful. I would never take a handout. I'm one of these Hispanic people that if you come to me and say, hey, I got some clothes for, for your kids. Would you like them? I go, no, get them out of here. I don't need your handouts. I'll get my own clothes. I just didn't like that. They'd have to sneak them to Virginia in order for the kids to get them and not tell me about them. You know? And so that kind of puffed me up. I'll do it myself. I'll do it myself. So why do we do things? Why do we do things? What's the motive? Where's our heart? We need to look at that. Why are you here? I don't want you to go. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, why are you here? 
Well, why are you here? Do you want to be a part of God's kingdom? Do you want to do work? Because I think the opportunities are in small churches right now. Try going to a bigger church, just trying to step in there, not knowing anyone, try to get involved. You might be able to get involved in something, you know, but you're very limited. Very limited. Come to small church, start praying, God, what do you want me to do? What kind of ministry? And, and you can start that thing and it can just, from there, you know, there's, there's no boundaries. <laughs> you know, it's just open field. The opportunities that you have in a small church, but what's your motive? Let's bring glory to God. Let's look to God and bring glory to Him. So how do we protect ourselves? Turn to Romans, and we'll finish with this, chapter 12. You all know this scripture. And if I can speak to the aspect of this scripture that probably needs more attention than any part of it, and that would be the obedience to it, right? The application of it. Because that's where we struggle. We've, hear, we've heard this verse over and over and over. But we struggle with applying it to our lives. Paul says, I beseech you. I beg you. I heed you. Uh, <laughs> I, got your, I, I got your pants leg and I'm tugging at you. Look, listen to me. You know, listen to me, you therefore brethren. My, my brother, my sister in the Lord. We're related because of Jesus Christ by the mercies of God that you present your body as a living sacrifice. And so he gives you that picture of how sacrifices were offered, right? Uh, you take a lamb, you would take it over to a block, and a lot of times these blocks would have some sort of shackles that you could shackle the lamb with, and then you would slit the throat. And then you take that lamb and you put it over to the brazen altar, and you let the blood flow as a sweet offering unto the Lord. That, that's a sacrifice. Present your bodies as a sacrifice. Isaac, when Abraham took him up to Mount Moroni, laid him on the altar, you know, I'm going to provide my son as a sacrifice. Moloch, which is a false god, they would take their babies and offer their babies up as a sacrifice to Moloch. Moloch would be put on fire, his hands would be red hot, and they would lay the baby on the, uh, on the hands and they would die from the heat. You know, the burns and so forth. Sacrifice. And Paul's saying here that we are to present our bodies as a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Not literally, but he's talking metaphorically here. That we are to be holy, acceptable to God. Which is a reasonable service for what he's done for us. He goes on. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You want to know the will of God? Then don't be conformed to this world. Get out of the world. You'll never know the will of God for your life if you're in the world. Get out of it. Start serving the Lord and following that carrot and watch how he reveals his will to you. He goes on and he talks about our responsibilities in verse 3 through 8 and the various gifts all the way down to verse 16. <clears throat> gifts that you may have. See, it's service. How, how do we live in a world that wants to enslave us? We become slaves to Jesus Christ. That's how. We become enslaved to Him. And we allow Him to be our master. And when He's our master, then no one else can enslave you. Because that's the law. If you were a slave back in the days of this country when they had slaves, you were that person's property. And no one else owned you but that person. No one could take you, otherwise they could be killed and hung for taking their property. You belong to that person. He purchased you, and you are now a part of his economy. And you have nowhere else to go. No one else can come take you. You are to do what he says. You'll be disciplined, you'll be corrected, you'll be fed and take care of at the same time. 
and you have a family. Now that's a negative picture for us in this country, even to this day. But take it and look at Christ. If we allow Him to be our master, we are His property. And He has nothing but good, right? Jeremiah 29.11 A future and a hope for us. A prosperity for us. We're His property. And no one can take us from Him. We belong to Him. And when we belong to Him and we're enslaved to Him, then the world has no power over us. Because we're serving Him. So serve Him. Give your life to Him. And see how you can survive through a world that wants to enslave you. Just as Jeremiah was surviving.